Welcome back, my gentle and modern apes. We are here with the second to last episode of Genesis Apologetics Seven Myths series. This is where we essentially watch Dan Biddle's lackey, this very high-pitched nasally narrator, not unlike yours truly, blather on and on and on off a script telling us why young earth creationism isn't just possible, it's just a fact. And today we are covering, of course, one of my personal favorites, Noah's Flood, the Noachian Deluge. And we are actually skipping one of the myths, and that's because it has to do with the author of the Pentateuch, which isn't really my wheelhouse or, you know, speed, I guess you would say. So I'm going to leave that to the more qualified individuals, and we're just going to stick with, with covering the flood today. Now I'm going to tell you ahead of time. This one is pretty rough. I've got an alcoholic beverage already on hand just because of how rough it is. And we're going to get through it together. Pray for me. Send me the good vibes. Do whatever you can because these... If you'll recall, when I was explaining the nature of creationist textbook Contested Bones, I referred to a sort of moronic force field that is emanated by really dumb creationist kind of monoliths of text. The same is true when it comes to these videos, the Genesis Apologetics videos. When you watch them, they actively vaporize the, the neurons inside your brain, uh, kind of tearing them apart on a molecular level, causing your grain white matter to dribble out your ears, and in some cases, out your nasal passages. So, wish me luck, because I really don't like Genesis Apologetics. One might even say, I really dislike them. <laughs> so we're going to hop right in. Uh, and, and it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be something. <laughs> it's going to be something. Myth number five is, the Bible's account of Noah's flood is just myth and was drawn from writings from the ancient Near East. To investigate this claim, we'll look at the global evidence for a worldwide flood the seaworthiness of the Ark, and answer tough questions like how could Noah fit all of the animals on the Ark? F Good! I'm so glad that one of the many things that we're discussing in this video is, I don't know, the heat problem, or how accelerated decay would work, you know, the real physics-busting aspects of trying to push the flood story, the one where if the flood did happen, be it by Answers in Genesis's catastrophic plate tectonics idea, or by Walt Brown and maybe Dan Biddle's hydroplate hypothesis, you're going to end up with a range of heat, um, one of which, minimum, would vaporize the granitic crust of the Earth, and thus everything on it, and the other, that being hydroplate, which would uh, release enough thermal energy to kind of see the effect as if you were detonating 12 H-bombs per square meter of water every day for the entire flood. I'm glad we're covering how many dog breeds were on the Ark. That's, mm, love it. Finally, we'll contrast the Bible's account of the flood with the leading flood myth from the ancient Near East, the Epic of Gilgamesh. First, let's take a... The Epic of Gilgamesh. He says that a little weird, that's nitpicky, but, you know, I, I really like to uh, to get Dan Biddle's lackey's goat, kind of. This isn't Dan Biddle speaking. Dan Biddle is like this ancient man. I don't know who this dude is, but he really grates on me. I, I hear his voice and, you know, my fight or flight reflex just activates. It's like when I see my sleep paralysis demon. This is what my sleep paralysis demon sounds like when I wake up in the middle of the night cold sweat. I hear this voice emanating from the corner of my room, uh, whispering, you know, uh, for our third myth, we're covering, I don't know, whatever dumb BS we're covering this week. Oh man, oh, one, so, so one thing you do have to give the credit to for Genesis Apologetics would be like, they do tend to make their own graphics. That's nice. I do think that that is nice. Um, that's all the good things. That's all of them quick look at the evidence for the worldwide year-long flood of the Bible. The Bible records that the flood commenced by the fountains of the great deep breaking open that led to the entire globe being covered with water, with the highest hills even submerged by 20 feet. If this happened as described, it would have left some amazing scars on the earth. That was a nice graphic. I do give them credit. <clears throat> I wish I would have found that graphic when I was making my hydroplate video. Speaking of which, this sounds a lot like 
the hydroplate hypothesis, doesn't it? This idea that the tectonic uh, boundaries on our planet are scars of the Noachian deluge. Of course, what this implies is that previously, prior to the deluge, the Earth's tectonic plates were just like a single eggshell-like covering on top of the mantle. Walt Brown of the Hydroplate Hypothesis, he's like this creationist dude, he suggests that this crust, this granitic crust, would have been like 20 to 60 miles thick. Like, he's just proposing this wickedly thick crust. And he additionally proposes that what eventually rendered the, the plates in twain was tidal pumping from the moon. So the moon goes around the Earth, and there's, of course, a bulge at the center, and once you, you know, reach certain distances, you're probably going to see a breaking up of, of those tectonic plates. Of course, that's not something that actually happened, because there have always been tectonic plates on the Earth. That's just the nature of having a mantle, like, like our planet has. Um, you know, tectonic plates move around because they're basically jigsaw pieces on top of a big molten table. Right, and as the molten core or molten core, sorry, molten mantle of our planet uh, undergoes convection currents, um, the <clears throat> cooler magma sinks and the warmer magma rises, and then they kind of create this convection current, and it slides the tectonic plates around. If you have a solid crust, right, um, that becomes really problematic, right? Like you, you can't have a solid crust and also like a mantle right underneath it, which is why Dan Biddle and the gang uh, are probably referring to Walt Brown's idea of in between this granite crust and the mantle, there's the fountains of the Great Deep, as he just said. They, the, there's these massive, like, interior seas, I guess you would call them, underneath the granitic crust, and then once the tidal pumping reaches a certain point, all that water just splooges outward, breaking right at the seam points, right? Spewing up into the air and then raining back down, covering the entire Earth, 20 feet on the tallest hills, uh, Biddle's boy here says. Um, of course, there are a couple of things that are at least a little bit problematic with that. Uh, allow me to remind you from my hydroplate notes. So, <laughs> if you're gonna go ahead and have, like, the fountains of the Great Deep bursting forth at all of our known tectonic boundaries, that's also gonna be at, like, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, places that we know of today, and... Since you've got, like, this unbroken crust sealing in these, these seas underneath this, whatever, 10 to 60 mile, you know, deep granitic crust, once that comes out, it's, like, been super pressurized underneath just two trillions of tons, I would say, of, like, granitic crust. So it's super pressurized, and thus it's super heated. So when all that water comes out, it sears everything alive on the surface of the earth uh, and boils all the seas off. So that's not great. <laughs> um, and mm, I don't know, it's, it doesn't really work with catastrophic plate tectonics, which is why I think it's going to be a weird deal listening to, listening to Genesis of Algetics' take, because I feel like it's going to be this weird amalgamation of both. But we'll, we'll go ahead and let them keep talking. This is exactly what we find with the 40,000 mile oceanic rift system that covers the Earth 1.9 times over, including the massive 10,000 mile mid-Atlantic ridge that quite obviously shows how these continents were once joined together and then pushed apart. Just check out this map with all the ocean water removed. The deep continental shelves become visible and we can see how the continents fit together like puzzle pieces to shape an Earth that used to be mostly a single landmass. Right, Pangea, um, or Rodinia, one of the many supercontinents that the planet had. But this isn't something that differentiates between conventional science and, like, whack-job hydroplate hypothesis. You know, credit where credit is due. At least catastrophic plate tectonics is like, yeah, we've got a heat problem, we're working on it. We know that if we move the continents around within the Noah's Flood time period, which is essentially what these creationists propose, they propose that you've got you know, Pangaea or Rodinia, this single supercontinent. And during the Noachian Deluge, um, whatever catastrophic event was occurring is shifting these tectonic plates all around to get them in their current position within that one single year, which means they were zooming around at, like, race car speeds. Yes, it is kind of wild, but at least they're like, yeah, we, we, we've got some issues we're working on, the AIG types, the ICR types. Hydroplate is just, like, 
Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. What are you gonna do? Looks like it happened. <laughs> Hydroplate, gang, gang. Um, and that's like their whole. That's like their whole stance. It, it's kind of batshit, honestly. But but we'll, we'll let them continue. This is especially obvious when looking at the matching jagged edges of Lower South America and Africa. We can also see this notch of submerged land off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland and how it perfectly fits into a slot north of Spain. These continents fit together so well because of the catastrophic linear rifting that occurred when the fountains of the Great Deep were pulled apart. What, how is that different from traditional plate tectonics, though? You, you get the same result either way. What Genesis Apologetics needs to do is say something along the lines of, Why, yes, this does look very much like conventional plate tectonics, but here is a reason why we know that they were actually moving quite quickly across the, the, the surface of the mantle, and why thus we know that it occurred during the year of Noah's Flood. Instead, they point to, like, plate tectonics, and they're like, oh, plate, plates move around, it must have been Noah's Flood, when it's like Alfred Wegener was, like, calling this plate tectonics a hundred years ago, right? Like, you, you can't just point at something and say, I made this. Uh, it's just kind of silly. Um, additionally, no one made a prediction about that. That's that's kind of a nitpick, but creationists very much like to be like, ah, yes, look at all these predictions we're making. And none of them predicted plate tectonics. That wasn't something that any of them said. I mean, add it to the pile of things that are wrong with the, the Noachian flood um, and, and just the that whole thing being responsible for all of the geology that we see today, but we'll, we'll continue onward. The Hebrew term used for this is bakat, which means to cleave, rent, or break and rip open, to make a breach. This couldn't describe what we see any better. They're already being cheap and reusing sots. See you, Genesis Apologetics. One of the largest tears, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, includes perpendicular faults along its entire length, showing the formation of new seafloor that occurred rapidly during the flood. No, 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 no. no. Not at all. Seafloor spreading looks like that when it's occurring slowly. We know that because seafloor spreading is occurring slowly right now as I'm speaking to you. So we, we know what slow seafloor spreading looks like. It looks like this. Tell me, Genesis Apologetics, what does fast seafloor spreading look like? And how can you support that with like empirical testing? Maybe run a model. I don't know. Maybe experiment. Just a thought. Not slowly over millions of years, the raised and sloped features on each side of the rift also testify to the hot and buoyant rock that still lies beneath it. it <clears throat> so, so again, he just says it looks like the seafloor has been spreading. It did this fast, not over millions of years. Okay, how do you know that? Why do you know that it occurred quickly instead of over millions of years? This is the opportunity for them to be like, it's because of Biddle's theorem. And then they like push some weird wonky idea, but at least it's something that exists. This guy's literally just being like, this would be like a flat earther being like, ha, you guys know those tectonic plates? Yeah, you know those are like jigsaw pieces of the massive flat plane that we live atop, right? That's exactly what we would expect if we lived on a flat earth. What? Why? How do you differentiate that between regular globe earth geology stuff? You can't. You're just asserting it and you and stealing, thiefing all of the conventional science terms to like make your idea sound less crazy. This is certainly something that happened quickly in the past and then slowed down greatly, as GPS measurements today indicate. The evolutionary view holds that these continents moved apart slowly mm -hmm. over millions of years. If this was true, the large rivers on the continents that straddle each sides of these rifts would have left a connected trail of mud stretching from one side of the Atlantic to the other. But what we see- Wait. What? Why? Why would it have done that? Is he not aware that, like, ocean currents are a thing? This is the reason why even now we can't see, as the plates are moving apart at their current rate of 1.1-ish inches per year. You could theoretically go back in time, you know, to the, the creation, let's say it's uh, 4,400 years, whatever they say, and be like, okay, this is right after the flood. Obviously, the plates have moved approximately 4,400 inches since the flood, if we're assuming a current rate, which 
We should, because there's no reason as to why we wouldn't. There's nothing to support the idea that they were moving faster or slower um, by without like uh, within a range of error, right? So, if that's the case, then we should see those those mud slicks from the position that they were 4,400 years ago to now. But we don't see that because of ocean currents, which are a thing. So it. If you can't support it within your own wild world view, how would you extrapolate that out onto conventional science? Doesn't make any sense. From the evidence is that they were rapidly split apart and then the draining and erosion started. Major rivers like the Congo, Mississippi, and Amazon run off the continents and have mud fans with only thousands of years worth of mud deposits. Only thousands of years of mud deposits. I think that's interesting. You know, I'm glad he's at least making more of an effort here and, and attempting to, to give us something legitimate. So let's look into that, the mud fans. What do you guys suppose I found? Let's take a look at it together. So if you'll recall, Genesis Apologetics was just telling us that the mud fan found at the um, delta of the Amazon and stretching out off of the continental shelf indeed is very young, clearly very young, and very problematic for evolutionary biology and all of conventional science, including geology and physics and all of this stuff, and definitely, definitely tells us the Earth is um, created 6,000-ish years ago. Well, a quick Google told me a few things. One, from Science Daily, and I tried to find out the original article, but it's actually not in English, so we're going to have to use this one. Back from 2009, the Amazon River is 11 million years old. Drilling study finds uh, this was essentially just boreholes that told us that based off of accumulation, even assuming fast accumulation, the fastest end of accumulation, it's at least 11 million years old based off of the actual length and breadth of the Amazon River fan. We can do a little better than that. We also have this very lovely paper here, which lets us know that the fastest accumulation was about 30 meters per 1,000 years. And, well, let me roll, scroll this up here so you can see the actual title of, yeah, there it is. The Amazon Harp Fan Model faces distributions in mud-rich deep sea fans based off of the systematic coring of architectural elements of the Amazon fan. Similar concept, lots of boring, lots of finding things out from January 2002. And when you take that very fast distribution, that fast end distribution, and you actually compare it to some of our lengths for the Amazon fan itself, you find that 30 meters ends up with an Amazon River mud basin of about 11 million years when you take the length and even assume fast distribution, you're at least looking at 7 million years for the Amazon basin. But we can do better than that. Late quaternary vegetation and climate change in the Amazon basin based off a 50,000 year pollen record from the Amazon fan. This is a cool one because what they did is they actually collected pollen, seasonal pollen over a 50,000 year period to track climate change in using the Amazon river fan and boring down and pulling pollen where it was embedded in the Amazon river fan. <laughs> of course, it you know is essentially not real pollen anymore, pollen fossils, things of that nature. But wouldn't you know it, it's still pretty damn old and that's this is this is like the closer levels of the fan. It gives this latitude and longitude and tells us where it is on the continental shelf. And it tell this is for the the fifty thousand year record for the Amazon basin. So we could we could take it a little bit further though. We could go to the nineteen eighty five paper, as old as it gets indeed the dawn of time, called Amazon Fan Atlantic Ocean. And this lets us know that the Amazon deep sea fan began to form the early Miocene as characterized by a highly meandering distributionary channel system. Uh, on the middle fan, these channel levels, level channels, my mistake, coalesce to form two broad levy com complexes. Older now buried levy complexes are also observed within the fan. So wouldn't you know you can actually go into the fan and see older fan complexes. Probably only one or two channels are active at any given time. Sediments reach the fan only during glacio-eustatic low strands during, uh, yeah, low strands during sea level. 
low strands of sea level. Coarse sediment largely bypassed the upper and middle fan via channels and are deposited on the lower fan. Cool, early Miocene. You guys wanna know how old the early Miocene is? I'll give you a hint. We already know, we've already covered it. I, did I spell Miocene wrong? No. Um, yeah. 23 million years. So, we're looking at something that's pretty old. Now you might be thinking, well, isn't that a little bit strange that this one says 23 million years versus that uh, science article, so uh, whatever live science article that discussed the Amazon River being approximately 11 million. Uh, that's because rivers do indeed change and the way geology works. Sometimes when rivers change, they take on different river names. So the, the, the Amazon River is indeed one essential thing. It's kind of like Pangaea's made, made up of a bunch of different continents. Those continents are still recognizable as what we see today. It's just then they were Pangaea, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and then we also have a discussion on the, the Pleistocene, certain Pleistocene deposits. The Pleistocene is um, 2.5 million years old at the oldest and 11,700 years at the youngest. And we're talking about early Middle, C middle Pleistocene deposits. Um, we also have detrital zircons. These, these are also kind of problematic. This is the one that actually discusses the, the zircons from the Pleistocene. So no Genesis apologetics. No, the Amazon mud fan does not tell us the Earth is young. The Amazon mud fan is very, very problematic for young Earth creationism. And I would wager, if I were to sit here and go to the Mississippi and look at the Congo, a couple of other rivers, we would find similar things. Um, the interesting thing is, now this creates this weird additional problem for flood geology where they've got to account for all of these weird pollen cycles within the facies of the amazon mud fan they have to account for the the, the um uh, what's the word i'm like the deposition rates and how they vary all while there's a global flood that is destroying all life on earth while the continents race around at race car speeds not millions. Also, there are flat sand bottoms on each side of these continents showing they were split apart rapidly. They don't have millions of years worth of runoff with extensive mud extending out into the ocean. Again, we've already discussed this. Ocean currents are in fact a thing. And when ocean currents aren't sweeping things up to that speed because of consistent deposition, as we just learned, which was educa educational for me as well, actually getting a chance to look that up and see why the Amazon River leaves much more deposition uh, that, that is, I guess, heavier and not as easy for ocean currents to sweep up when compared to regular runoff from the rest of the continents. Um, but, you know, it's this stuff takes not a lot of Googling. I'm not a geologist, but I can figure it out. Can you, Dan Biddle? These rivers began shaping and eroding only thousands of years ago, not millions. The fossil record that now straddles both sides of this global tear testifies to the rapid nature of this catastrophe, with millions of the same kinds of animals that were once living together now found buried in mud layers on either side. Global geology joins this testimony with recent analysis of... Oh, you know, he, like, he wants to like skip over that, but how is that any different from conventional plate tectonics? How is that different? Wegener's lines were actually like composed based off of where uh, Listosaurus, was it Listosaurus? I think it was Listosaurus, and uh, Glossipterus. Glossipterus? Please be Glossipterus. Yeah, Glossipterus. Wegner's lines, maybe? Wegner's lines? Wegner lines? Please. It is Glossipterus, isn't it? Oh my god, am I going to embarrass myself? Uh, nope, Glossipterus. <clears throat> I'm getting them every day. Um, and then let's see. Mesosaurus, not, not Listosaurus. Mesosaurus, Cyanognathus, from the Triassic. And cool, 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 cool. No, Listosaurus right here. Sweet. Look at this. So here's something cool. <laughs> that is problematic for the flood. Wow. 
wow, it's almost like you could keep a running list. But something that could play some support for flood geology is if you looked at where these Listosaurus are deposited in Africa, India, and Antarctica, you looked at where the Glossipterus were deposited, you looked at where the Mesosaurus were deposited, and you looked at where the Cyanognathus were deposited, and you check to see if they were within the same layer, right? Because what we find is that these guys are in the same layer, right? But it's not the same layer as these guys. And these guys are in the same layer, but it's not the same one as what we see in Glossipterus. Glossipterus are in the same layer, but it's not the same one that we see in Mesosaurus. Why is that? If, if this happened at race car speeds, should we not at least find some of them inhabiting the same layer? You might be thinking, well, how can you tell? Geochemistry, my friend, it's um, an excellent tool. So again, we, we maintain pro... But you know, that's what he does. Ooh, Dan Biddle and the boys, they, they zoom from concept to concept before you have an opportunity to address it. That's why the pause button is nice. Um, and, and you know, it's one of those things where each individual topic takes its own special segment to debunk. Man, I wish there were a word for that. Like maybe a, maybe like a like a turn of phrase for debate. You could call it like a like a biddle bop, or just a gish gallop. Eighteen hundred boreholes from around the world, revealing six mega sequences of the flood that indicate its worldwide extent. Nope, nope. The thing is, is that is additionally indistinguishable from boreholes that were taken from areas that were indeed underwater during various periods of sea level rise and fall. For instance, <laughs> there were areas that were underwater during the Jurassic that are no longer underwater. And there are areas from around the world that were underwater in the Jurassic that are no longer underwater. If you took boreholes from those sections, you would probably find a lot of this, a lot of similar sequences, mega sequences, with similar like isotopic ratios. That's not really seen support of the global flood, right? I'd be very interested to see where exactly these um, these boreholes came from. Let's see. If, I wonder if we can't the find world, the paper revealing six mega sequences of the flood that indicate its worldwide extent. Billions of fossils it. buried in the mud around the world, including 13 states of dead dinosaurs mixed with marine life in the middle of America. Yeah, let's look at that. That's very interesting. Hold on. Uh, uh, uh. Fossils buried in the mud around the world, including 13 states of dead- Boom. Let's play a game. The Atlantic Seaway. Jurassic. The Western Interior Seaway, that's what it's called. Okay. Where are you, United States? Ah, here it is. The Western Interior Seaway. Let's open that in a new tab. Okay, pull that over here. Hmm. Wow, it kind of looks like the Western Interior Seaway went right through here. So it kind of looks like it would be appropriate if you found Jurassic, terrestrial, and marine fauna along these areas, considering if you're finding marine fauna down the middle, Jurassic, terrestrial fauna on the sides. Well, that kind of matches up the Interior Seaway, you know, the one that conventional science has proposed and has proposed for decades. Hmm. Dead dinosaurs mixed with marine life in the middle of America. What type of flood could do this? Just how much water would it take to bury millions of land creatures under hundreds of feet of mud in this 13 state, 700,000 square mile area? It's not hundred, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not hundreds of feet of mud. It's things die and then like regular deposition occurs over long periods of time. In the case of some of these fossil graveyards, they existed in what's called ephemeral lakes or areas that were lakes during some parts of the year and they would experience an influx of detritus, dead animals, things like that. But they weren't lakes during all of the year. So they would experience wet and dry spells and things would be sticking halfway out of the mud decomposing while the part that was underneath the mud was essentially petrified, fossilized. 
which is interesting, and you can actually tell which parts of the animal was sticking out and which parts were not, because the parts that were sticking out have insect boreholes through them and nibbling from scavengers and things like that, whereas the stuff that was underneath the mud doesn't. Now, how do you get that during a flood? And just how did so many land creatures get buried together with marine life with 97% of the dinosaurs found disarticulated? You know, this one always kills me, right? It's, it's the disarticulation is what the flood does. Kills things, disarticulates them. But at the same time, they'll point to things like animals fossilized in the middle of eating another animal, usually this is sea life, or give, during giving birth, ich ichthyosaurs giving birth, and they'll be like, oh my god. It had to have been during the middle of the flood. They, they were fossilized instantly, perfectly articulated fossils. The only way to explain that is the flood. So the flood does both. It's Schrodinger's fossilization method. That's what the flood is. Uh, ichthyosaur birthing fossil. This is a cool fossil. We're going to look at this anyways, because it's kind of neat. An extraordinary find of a fossil of 250 million years old. Air breathing sea creature must have given birth on land, not in sea. That's not really the one we're looking for. This is the one we're looking for. There's the live birth occurring in media res. Very cool stuff. Um, but yeah, <laughs> researchers say they can't understand why so many animals gathered in what is today the city of Zhu Xing to die. 15,000 bones stacked in incredible density. Well, I imagine they didn't choose it. <laughs> I imagine that it was something like Oh, I don't know, a massive mudslide or volcanistic event occurring in a local fashion or perhaps some local flood. You know, things that occur today and do this kind of thing. One thing we haven't seen today is a global flood. We've seen some big ones, though, in the fossil record, like those with the Washington Scablands. Basically, an ancient mega paleo lake broke. And all of this water came rushing out, you know, millions and millions of tons of water. And they carved into the Washington Scablands, what is now known as the Washington Scablands. And when they carved this area, the, it, the water fans out. It doesn't carve in a straight line. Which is why the Washington Scablands are a great opportunity to say, if Noah's Flood created the Grand Canyon, it wouldn't have carved it in that fashion. I'll show you what I mean. Washington Scablands mega flood. How did the channeled scablands form? Scablands flooding. Ancient scablands flooding from a paleo lake. Yeah, so you see this? This is the result of the flooding here. Not this part. This part. Well, now I'm getting an ad probably. Or it's telling me to leave. Um, yeah, large, large mega floods created the channeling in the Scablands. But it doesn't channel in the same way that we see in the Grand Canyon, which is formed by one single meandering river doing so over millions of years. This would be the perfect opportunity for creationists to be like, ah, see, this is what a big flood does. But we know there's been big floods. They're rare, but they do happen. They just don't act like what creationists need them to act like. Let's see if we can't get a better picture here. Show me the money, Jerry. Yeah, so like this. Lots of mega sequences carved out here and here and here and here, um, behaving in this weird, like almost tendrilly fashion rather than what a um, Grand Canyon style mega flood would be, which is one single channel being carved. And many of the remaining 3% that are found intact discovered in mud layers with their necks arched back, suffocating as they die. Catastrophic plate tectonics. Okay, we're going the catastrophic plate tectonics way. Why do dinosaurs die in a death pose? Who wants to guess it's rigor mortis? Bird fossils. Dinosaur and bird fossils are frequently found in a characteristic posture of the head thrown back, tail extended, and the mouth wide open. The cause of this posture, sometimes called the death pose, has been a matter of scientific debate. Traditional explanations range from strong ligaments in the animal's neck desiccating uh, and contracting the body to draw and contracting to draw the body into this pose to water currents arranging the remains in position. Foe and Padlian, Pad Padian, Foe and Padian in 2007 suggested that the live animal was suffering uh, opisthonotis in its death throes. A study conducted by Cutler and Britt suggests that the pose is the result of submersion in water after death. Seconds after placing a chicken carcass in the, in the water, animals assume the death pose. 
etc etc neat i mean it's cool um but you know it's it's this after death it takes this pose after death so i don't know necessarily that water is going to be the case always because we do indeed have fossils that arrange in that fashion do the traditional death pose that we know weren't the result of, of a watery grave that being said what was that city that, that they just wanted us to look at zen whatever zen long zen hold on water would it take to bury millions of land creatures under hundreds of mm -hmm. feet of mud in this 13 state 700 000 square mile area and just how did so many land creatures get buried together with marine life Biddle, with 97 percent of the dinosaurs found disarticulated okay zu chang let's see uh zu chang dinosaur fossil grave yard let's see the zu chang fossil site is a city in the shadong province of china perhaps the greatest treasury of dinosaur fossils in the 20th century world's largest hadrosaur found here Let's see. Dinosaur bones were smuggled out, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, why is it like this? Excavation pit. Such a high concentration of fossil bones in such a small area suggests they died together and suddenly. Scientists believe a volcanic eruption may have killed the dinosaurs and a subsequent flood carried them to Zhu Qing, which may have been a wetland covered in grass. Hmm. Boy, I bet they know that by like the geochemistry or something along those lines. Dinosaur graveyard promises clues to extinction. Let's see here. Most of the bones date back to the late Cretaceous, more than 100 million years ago. Ranging, blah, blah, blah. Let's see, commenting is now closed. Damn, I really wanted to like leave my thoughts on this. Site consists of 15 separate areas. The large, okay, let's see. There's gotta be something more concrete concentrations this is a 2020 paper at least on a new dinosaur species but i don't think it tells us actually why this area exists detrital zircon dating and tracing the provenance of dinosaurs 2016 Lake cretaceous let's see maybe we'll get something in the abstract abstract hacking the mass burial of dinosaur bone fossils from the late Cretaceous in the Wangxi group in Zhuqing, Shaodong province has been a research focus in recent years. However, the provenance of dinosaur bones, accurate depositional age remains ambiguous. Though uranium lead dating of the detrital zircons con collected from six conglomerate samples from the dinosaur bone beds, we found that the youngest single grain was approximately 77.3 million years ago, representing the maximum depositional age uh, of the dinosaur fossil bed and sediments. This also indicates that the Hong Tuya formation was deposited during the Campanian. Ooh. Dating results revealed, revealed an age peak of 120 to 110 million years ago, which corresponds with the peak of volcanic rocks during the lower Cretaceous. So that's why they're saying it was perhaps volcanic, is because the older ones are indeed volcanic in nature. Let's see. There's some pyroclastic rocks, three different data sets. Study revealed that the areas. Uh, let's see. Secondary source, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so there's there's some heavy support that there's some weird volcanism going on. The interesting thing is some of those volcanic rocks require, like, oh, I don't know, not being in water to form. Neat. Neat, folks. Today, these types of tsunamis still occur, although much less frequently and on a smaller scale. The spreading seafloor subducts, binds under the land masses, and then releases, creating mud-filled tsunamis that carry debris and sea life onto land, sorting them in layers, this is exactly what we see in dinosaur graveyards. <laughs> Sorting them in layers. Exactly like how a, a seaway intrusion and a regression would work. The seaway rises, right? The, the sea level rises and creates a seaway. You get a ton of marine life depositing. And then as the climate changes, it retreats. This is something that does indeed happen. But instead, they're proposing mud tsunamis. Incredible. I love it. But you, so you have to think to yourself, okay, there's got to be a way to differentiate those two. And in my mind, the way to differentiate it would be to look at some of the plankton, some of the, the smaller microorganisms, to see if you can support, provide support for the idea that these animals lived um, 
contemporaneously with one another. Unfortunately, that's not what you find. Dating different dinosaur layers in both marine and terrestrial, depending if they were coastal or not, with pollen grains is something that does happen. And that doesn't work if you're using mud tsunamis, okay? What we should find is, is a single type of phytoplankton being consistently deposited, single type of pollen being consistently deposited, but that's not what we find. We find evidence for slow deposition, seasonality, uh, change in forms, like evolution, if you will, of life. Um, that's why um, microorganisms like plankton make such great index fossils. Yards today around the world. North America provides some clues to the massive nature of the flood. In fact, even secular geologists refer to what's known as the widespread late Cretaceous transgression, which is just technical jargon for worldwide flood. Dude. <laughs> so the fun thing with the serpent is. <laughs> That's like being like, <laughs> they say that evolution, even mainstream evolutionary biologists say evolution has occurred, but evolution is just technical jargon for creation. That's absurd. That is absolutely absurd. There's not even a way to comment on how dumb that is. If I encountered this guy, like, in public saying something like this, I would probably have to slap myself a few times to make sure, first of all, that I wasn't in some feverish hell dream. Um, but then second of all, I'd ask him if he'd just blown in from stupid town, because that's one of the most moronic things I've ever heard, let alone, I mean, the, 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 the sheer ignorance or the absolute deceit is it's left me gobsmacked it's left me gobsmacked how does a serpent talk <laughs> what, what and not only that but why is the serpent's punishment studies have revealed that a sea level rise of 310 meters is required to flood the cretaceous layers based on their current elevation However, the maximum thickness of the fossil layers produced by a 310 meter sea level rise is only about 700 meters. The challenge is that in North America, nearly 50% of the Cretaceous layers contain strata thicker than 700 meters, indicating that the continents had to sink and buckle during this global inundation. This is exactly what the catastrophic nature of the flood would have done. Again, why, why is this problematic for regular plate tectonics over long periods of time? I mean, most of these hypotheses were generated, like, by conventional science, right? Like, conventional science was like, oh, damn, like, kind of looks like our, our continental plates were doing this weird sinking and buckling during the Cretaceous in these areas. Boy, that sure is strange. Wow. Hmm. Well, it certainly helps us date certain areas a little bit better. And then... You know, the, the, the creationists come along and they're like, <laughs> absolute moron. This is so clearly flood geology. This is so clearly from the Noachian deluge. Checkmate evolutionists. And, and then they like dab or floss or, you know, do some cool like Dan. I'm just kidding. Ken Ham isn't that hip. I don't know that he, I, Dan Biddle certainly isn't that hip. There's just no way that rising sea levels alone can explain the fossil record in North America. Argument from incredulity. Something much more catastrophic that warped and submerged the continents just had to be involved. Why? Next, let's investigate whether the Ark was seaworthy. God gave certain dimensions to Noah for building the Ark. 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Using the nipper cubit at 20.4 inches, this works out to a vessel about 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, and 51 feet high. Accounting for a 15% reduction in volume due to the hull curvature, the Ark had about 1.88 million cubic feet of space, the equivalent of 450 semi-trailers of cargo space, twice as long as a Boeing 747 and stretching over one and a half football fields. This was a massive ship. So, I've ridden in a couple of Boeing 747s in my day, mostly for, like, research or broad purposes, and, um, and some for leisure. But the thing is, is that they're big, but they're not, like, every animal in the world big, right? Two of them aren't every animal in the world big. A football field isn't every animal in the world big. Now, here's where we do the thing where we gesture wildly to the concept of kinds, but then don't create a set of criteria by which we can identify what a kind is, 
where one kind ends and one begins, or how much variety can be produced within a kind. This is what you call um, hypergesturing. But was such a vessel seaworthy? Interestingly, the Ark's dimensions were about the same as modern shipping vessels, making a fitting shape for handling ocean swells that are typically spaced out in such a way that ships of this size fare well at sea. This dude, this dude was literally just talking about hyper tsunamis, and he's trying to put something that looks like a modern shipping vessel out there and saying, you know, modern shipping vessels. It looks like it's, mm, looks like it looked another win for creationists. The shipping vessel and, and the Ark, they seem to have a lot of similarities. And I suppose that means that the Ark could have handled swells as well as a cargo ship. Um, I don't think cargo ships do so hot against hyper tsunamis. Not to mention the fact that still all of this superheated, boiling steam is shooting from, shooting from the rended in twain cracks in the tectonic plates, searing everything alive within a few hundred miles of it, boiling the seas. We haven't even gotten to the part where they've got to accelerate the radiometric decay, where they've got to account for every single crater of every single asteroid that's hit the planet, including the Chicxulub impact, and indeed, all of the impacts that were greater in size, of which there are indeed a handful, within a single year. Keep in mind the Chicxulub impact was at least partially on the water as well, so you're not going to create any kind of mitigation effect by having these things hit a, a planet covered in, in a, you know, a single panthalassic sea. In fact, Dr. Xian Wan Hong, who holds a PhD in applied mechanics from the University of Michigan, this, this to me is like, oh god, this is so mean, but this is, this to me is like when they, when they bring up the ancient aliens guy, right, and they're like, ah yeah, this guy's got like a BS in, I don't know, like, what is, what is he qualified in? Who's the ancient aliens guy? Ancient aliens guy. George, <laughs> there he is. He's a UFOologist. Interesting. I want to know what his, um, if he has any formal education. Yeah, bachelor's degree in communications. This is very similar to that. This is like bringing, o bringing up uh, Giorgio here onto your ancient alien show and being like, this guy, he's a college educated man. And he supports our idea that the pyramids were built by like aliens or some shit. And then you're like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Well, like, what's his degree in? And they're like, communications. Okay, you can bring a mechanical engineer onto this if you very well like, but the second that you call it safety investigation of Noah's Ark in a seaway, um, you're losing a bit of credibility in the same way that a bachelor's of communication is a fine degree, but when you slap it on as some kind of um, authority quote, authority claim for something crazy like ancient aliens, um, you come up with some problems. I wonder if um, uh, Mr. Hong has taken into account the mega tsunamis, or the hypercanes, or the roiling hot steam when investigating the safety of Noah's Ark in a seaway. Conducted a study on the seaworthiness of Noah's Ark at the World Class Ship Research Center, Krissa. Dr. Hong's team compared 12 different hull designs of various proportions and found that the Ark, based on the biblical dimensions, outperformed all others because it carefully balanced the conflicting requirements for stability, resistance to capsizing, passenger stability, or sea keeping, and strength. Like a boat is designed to do? This man, this man comes up on the camera, he has the audacity to, to come onto this YouTube channel and tell us that Noah's Ark was built like a boat. What? The study also confirmed that the Ark could handle waves as high as 100 feet without capsizing. 100 feet. Mega, no wait, sorry, yeah. Tsunami height? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, hmm. Uh, <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> uh, you 
can't Noah parody it. Noah was instructed by God to coat the inside and the outside of the ark with pitch, a thick, gooey substance secreted by trees as a means of protection against infection. That's not what pitch is. What is pitch? Pitch is an oil. Um, liquid. We don't want to bias it by saying oil. Pitch is the name for any number of highly viscous liquids which appear solid, most commonly bitumen. Tar pitch flows at a very low rate. Let's try bitumen. Bitumen. A black viscous mixture of hydrocarbons obtained naturally or as a residue from petroleum distillation. You don't give me that tree shit, Genesis Apologetics. Or insect attack. When heated into a liquid state and applied to ship planking, pitch hardens almost instantly into a protective waterproof shell. Very similar to how epoxy or fiberglass are used in shipbuilding today. The strong outer shell provided by hardened pitch adds both strength and waterproofing beyond the natural capability of the wood. I feel like I haven't properly expressed why it's problematic that it's from petroleum distillation um, because petroleum is a fossil fuel and fossil fuels take millions of years to form. Now, if you're a creationist, typically you're going to propose that the fossil fuels that we have today were formed during Noah's Ark. Well, that's kind of a little bit of a problem if you're Noah and you need the fossil fuels that formed during the Ark to build the Ark. You see what I mean, gang? These divine shipbuilding instructions given to Noah certainly seem to make realistic sense. Next, let's look at one of the most frequently asked questions about the Ark. How could it fit all the animals? Skeptics frequently scoff at the idea of packing all the animal species onto the Ark, but the solution is found in this very objection. Noah didn't have to load all animal species on the Ark. He only had to load the animal kinds. Now, <clears throat> because I'm going to assume this is a premiere, because that's how I roll, and that's also what you guys like, which is why it's how I roll. <laughs> I try to sound badass, but then I didn't sound badass. I sounded like a wiener. Um, put ones in the chat if you think that we're going to get a concise and clear explanation for what delineates a kind. And then put twos in the chat if you think there's no damn way that we're going to get that. I'm going to let you guys do that while we listen to this portion. Also appreciate the, the very intentional inclusion here of Ceratopsians as its own member of the Creation Orchard, as well as chimpanzees. Now, I'm assuming, I can only assume one of these branches is humans and one is chimps, and that this is actually Sahelanthropus chidensis, or perhaps Oreopithecus bimbolii. For example, there are over 300 dog breeds and over 300 horse breeds, and all breeds within these two animal kinds are interfertile, producing offspring representing a mix in between the two parents. The same is true for many other animal groups. Collapsing these animal trees results in a very feasible number of animal kinds, less than a few thousand, that... Wait, I want to see that again. ...other animal groups. Collapsing these animal trees results in a very feasible number of animal kinds. Yeah, we... I see you, Genesis Apologetics. You're not unintentional with your usage of the chimp without humans being anywhere attached. Yeah, so... Using kinds as if it's some means by which you can actually delineate individual, um, uh, or rather, I'm, I apologize, I'm, I've already had too much to drink. If you're going to use reproductive parameters, like the ability to hybridize as some kind of means by which to delineate a kind, you're going to run into a few problems. <sighs> there are a lot of animals that would be considered different kinds that can indeed procreate. Um, and not just procreate, but create organisms that are indeed viable in and of themselves. One is the American paddlefish with the Chinese paddlefish. These are organisms um, that absolutely, by all intents and purposes, should not be able to hybridize. Um, for one, they're just, ah, oh, they look different, which is, of course, the main criteria for any creationist. But more importantly, they're genetically very, very isolated from one another, and yet they can indeed hybridize. 
well, does that mean that these two are different kinds? Well, I don't know. That's a really good question. If hybridizability is the only criteria, that also creates problems for organisms that can't hybridize within their kinds. If you have a single feline kind, a felidae, well, what are you going to do when the fact that your lion and your tiger create a, an infertile offspring in the liger? Moreover, if the kind is approximately at the family level, how do you cope with humans being the same kind as chimpanzees and gorillas and gibbons and orangutans? Of course, the answer for most creationists is you just don't put humans in that group. But it does create a couple of problems because there has been some hypothetical work on whether or not humans and chimps could in fact hybridize. It has a lot to do with the idea, right? Now, thank God this is all hypothetical. But it all boils down to this hypothetical idea that a human egg is guarded by a zona pellucida. Now, the zona pellucida is essentially something that gatekeeps the human egg, and it makes sure that whatever comes in um, is appropriately human. The zona pellucida is what's responsible for keeping humans and chimpanzees from being capable of interbreeding. But in vitro is a thing, so theoretically you could bypass the zona pellucida and maybe get something that started dividing. Some people have claimed that that's a thing that can happen just by the by the you know work that's been done on hybridizability in general. I don't know about that. I don't know if I would want that. I mean, I know I wouldn't I wouldn't want it conceptually, but it would be interesting to know. Um, I don't think that outweighs the ethics by any means. That would be indeed very horrifying. But kinds also creates another few problems. I'm going to tell you those right after I grab another drink. What's up, gamers? I'm back. Let's talk about some more problems with kinds outside of them just being kind of arbitrary. There is no empirical line by which one can create a kind, right? We know that certain organisms, as they kind of move more from their ancestral form, depending on which species we're deeming the ancestral form and which is the current modern derived form, that there is a level of inbreeding that goes on, interbreeding that goes on, the closer you get to that divergence point. I would imagine the same would be true for creationists. Even as you've got your ancestral feline kind, after they start diverging, well, I'm sure there's a part, right, a period of time where what would become lions and what would become tigers could interbreed. So what do you do when you've got two separate kinds, like the dog kind and the bear kind? Uh, what do you do when you've got something like an amphicyonid, which is... A bear dog. Who does the bear dog belong to? What kind does the bear dog belong to? Now, today, right, we have all sorts of different kinds of canids and all sorts of different kinds of, I guess you would call them like ursids, and we've got pretty much everything in between. And the lines by which they can interbreed and cannot interbreed are quite weird. Some animals that are considered canids can interbreed with one another, and some can't. And the reason is because species are arbitrary and kinds aren't a real thing. So all of these guys, for example, are technically considered canids. Now, can a wolf interbreed with a finnick fox? Well, no, it kind of can't. What about with a regular fox? Well, no, it can't do that either. Can wild dogs interbreed with wolves? Well, we don't know. They're separated by quite a bit of geographic space. Um, you can look at the evolution of canids in general and how they come from these kind of small and more unassuming carnivore or carnivorans, rather. Um, but, but the problem is there is nothing empirical by which to really denote a kind. We've got bear dogs here, we've got African painted dogs, we've got wolves, we've got jackals, all sorts of different canids, tanukis, which can breed with which and why. Um, at one point, does a kind stop being a kind, too? So a dog can't interbreed with a fox, at least to our knowledge. So were they originally part of the same kind, or have they only recently become different kinds? And if kinds can become different kinds, how is that at all empirical with regard to what we see in, like, the fossil record, right? Because if kinds can beget new kinds that then can no longer interbreed with one another, well, it ceases to be something that you can at all even pretend to draw lines with. So let's let's continue onward. It's less than a few thousand that could board the Ark, get off a year later, and then spread around the world and reproduce into the varieties within kinds we see today. Now let's compare the biblical flood to the leading flood myth, the Epic of Gilgamesh. 
In 1853, archaeologists found a series of 12 tablets dated to around 650 BC, although parts of the story existed in earlier fragmentary versions. Because the story had many of the same elements as the Genesis account, skeptics believed that Gilgamesh preceded the biblical account, negating the Genesis account as just a spin-off. Honestly, I, I think this is a good point to stop. We might have to go ahead and separate this one into two pieces, just because this one's already long. And I'm already feeling a little bit tired of dealing with it. I don't know that I have, like, the, the ethereal energy to deal with all of this. Not to mention, um, I, I went ahead and checked forward, and a lot of this deals with textual criticism and uh, archaeology with regard to the Epic of Gilgamesh and other similar uh, ancient Near Eastern tales. And that's something that I would like to brush up on, as it's not typically a wheelhouse thing of mine. I think I could do the work, the work for it and, and the research, which I'm going to go ahead and do. Um, but for the time being, we'll go ahead and end this with... A bang, I suppose. So Genesis Apologetics has really bad geology and really, really, really bad biology. Their attempts at accounting for all of the biodiversity that we see today um, isn't great. It's it's pretty much a bummer, and the geology is, is abysmal, is really the only way of putting it. So I'm going to go ahead and run the credits now and um, go to bed and try to get the strength up to, uh, to do a part two, uh, because... Now I've turned two more videos into three more videos, haven't I? Um, but thank you for sticking along. I do, I do enjoy having you here. You, you do make this worthwhile for me. So thank you for being here, and um, cheers.